Can you guys hear me? Yes. Thanks, Irene. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. My name is Nicolas Belmonte. I run the visualization team here at Uber. And um, today I'm going to be talking about a framework we've developed that's called DECGL. It's in version 4, and I am announcing it right now, so probably should provide some background, like, hey, what happened? Like, you don't release something in V4. Um, so I joined Uber about two years ago um, and started a visualization team there. So people there act as a functional team, like, you know, like design or data science. They go in and embed into, like, different other teams um, to solve visualization problems, right? So within data products, you can imagine, you know, experimentation or machine learning visualization or even, like, you know, partnering with a self-driving car kind of uh, team to kind of have these 3D immersive visualizations that I cannot show, which are really cool. Uh, anyways, we started using uh, DECGL for that, and so it's been stretched and used in many different use cases around geospatial visualization, but also um, for abstract data visualization use cases, and we've decided to open source this um, end of last year. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about this framework. Um, so what is DECGL? If I were to summarize it, is a large-scale WebGL-powered uh, data visualization library. Um, large-scale means, you know, you may have data-dense visualizations. Um, that doesn't mean that you need to render a million, uh, you know, points on a screen. Um, you can use WebGL today to do also, like, data processing and data manipulation and aggregation and filtering and so on. So this framework also attempts to uh, basically help you with that. Um, but also, if you were to render a thousand elements, or ten thousand, or a hundred, or a million, um, this can can be done with it as well. Um, we decided to go with WebGL. There's a new major version being released. Um, has been released like a few weeks ago. WebGL 2. It allows for uh, a lot of interesting, um, you know, general purpose like GPU programming type of stuff. Um, and we're planning to kind of conquer that space with DECGL as well. So. Again, high-performance GPU computing, we've used it, you know, Uber manages billions of GPS points every day, so we've used this uh, with maps primarily. Um, it does something very specific very well, uh, and then it plays really well with other libraries. So, you know, you can hook it with React, um, or you can hook it here with uh, Mapbox GL, which uh, <coughs> provides a perspective mode. So what we do here, for example, is we use Mapbox GL as the base layer, and then on top of that, we overlay um, uh, different uh, layers built with DECGL. And so you see how the camera systems are synchronized and stuff like that. Um, the other interesting thing is it follows this like instancing and layering paradigm. So uh, the instancing paradigm, you might know it from, from D3, like this data binding, right? Like you're creating a scatter plot, you have an array of, of points, of elements, and then you map them one to one to circles, right? And so what you do with that selection is, you know, it's instancing a bunch of circles and then you can tweak, tweak them, right, by switching or changing a few attributes. Um, uh, coincidentally, like WebGL2 is extremely efficient at doing that. It's called instancing and you could have, for example, a, you know, cone or a sphere or whatever primitive, like a circle, and you can instance many of those with just only one call. Um, and so you'll get uh, basically very efficient way to, to do this sort of data binding. So we follow this pattern, which is both interesting from the InfoVis perspective, but also interesting uh, as well from the WebGL-like performance type of, of perspective. And then the layering paradigm comes from GIS, right? Like you have a map, and then you have multiple layers. Like a layer could be, you know, land and water. Another one could be like labels, uh, roads, etc. And you could now have layers on top of that that display data. In this case, we have um, you know, a scatterplot layer on the top left, a hexagonal layer on the top right, a grid layer on the bottom left, and an arc layer on the bottom right. And so it's a good way to reason about your data. Um, it's a good way to plug into the framework if you wanted to develop your own layers. Um, but we also provide like a dozen different layers that, that do these things for you. Um, as I mentioned before, the layers are not purely visual stuff. It's not you're only rendering stuff, but you can also perform different things like aggregation and filtering, uh, and so massaging the data in different ways um, that, you know, uh, all happen within the layer as well, right? Uh, and so you could imagine this as well as, you know, uh, combining, uh, for example, D3 with DECGL as a Voronoi layer. You pass in a bunch of sites, and then the layer uses D3 Voronoi to compute the polygons, and then it renders it with the polygon layer inside, right? So you have this sort of like, 
way of adapting code and doing some data processing um, uh, in, in, the, in the process. Uh, what we're looking at here is like a hexagonal layer. We're changing the granularity for the grouping and we're changing a few of the visual attributes and we're also like filtering by uh, percentile. So as you slide the upper percentile, you basically remove the top percentile of the distribution. Uh, we've used it for abstract data visualization. Um, so we, I mentioned we do some of the machine learning visualization stuff as well. Uh, here we're visualizing uh, the output of an embedding uh, using TSNI. Uh, this is clustering uh, spheres representing stuff that I cannot tell you what it is, but it's very insightful. Uh, and the purple stuff is, is especially interesting if, if you know what it is. <laughs> um, finally, there's something that we're really proud of uh, that we've, we've worked on here with this framework, which is um, WebGL has a limitation, quote unquote, which is, you know, as you're coding your shading language, um, it only supports like 32-bit uh, uh, precision floats. So basically, there's only so much you can get from it. And if you were using GPS, like global positioning systems, and you want to get that to like the centimeter level, for example, um, well, you know, WebGL would not enable you to support that. And so there's a lot of things that maps do, like you know, using web workers or changing like coordinate systems and stuff like that to, to be able to support that. We took a fully different approach. We um, basically, it's a brute force maybe approach. Like we decided to emulate 64-bit computations um, operations uh, by basically doing this technique where you pack two 32-bit floats into a vector two and then we had to basically redefine all math operations, linear and nonlinear in the shader, so that you could support 64-bit. Anyways, what that means is that um, when I show this very trippy image, uh, on the left, you have the 32-bit precision. Um, it tells you how much you can go. And then on the right one, you get to see that you can go exponentially further, right? And so all that is emulated in the GPU. Cool, so um, now that you know what it is and where you could be using it, um, how does it work? So if you open up the black box, this is how it looks like. Um, it starts, I would say, probably if we start from the left side, you know, you have this React component, it has some data, uh, you want to render it uh, using DECGL. Uh, let's imagine that you want to render it on top of a map. Then what we do here is the high level components that we provide are, you know, the family of frameworks that we have, DECGL, uh, React Map GL, which is a React-friendly wrapper around Mapbox GL, and uh, Luma GL, which is a lower-level library to do uh, WebGL rendering, um, which is internal mostly, so you, you, you would not need to play with it that much. Um, and so you pass in the data through the React component. The interesting thing with React Map GL is that um, the camera system and the viewport that DECGL has are combined. So as you pan, zoom, tilt the map, like both the layers and the map are, are synchronized. Um, and then as you pass your data, let's imagine you have a layer manager. Um, in this case, this is a, a rather complex example because you have a layer that has three sub-layers. So you could imagine this, let's imagine you want to render GeoJSON, right? So you pass in this GeoJSON to a layer, then uh, the layer says, well, you know, this feature is a point, so I delegate that to my scatterplot layer. This feature is a polygon, so I'll delegate this to my polygon layer. This feature is a line, I'll delegate this to my line layer. So you could kind of have composite layers in that way. But if you wanted to simplify your uh, you know, example here, we could just have one layer, that's the scatterplot layer. And LumaGL takes care of the rendering for that layer. Hopefully that makes it clear. Anyways, uh, so what's React Map GL? Um, so React Map GL, as I mentioned before, it's a React-friendly wrapper around uh, Mapbox GLJS. Um, and you know, if, if you don't know Mapbox GLJS, it's a WebGL uh, version of Mapbox, and it's amazing, and, and you should totally use it. Um, and then React Map GL, what it does is it provides a simpler uh, React-friendly interface on top of that. What you can put inside of your map can be anything. It can be a div, it can be a canvas. So this is where really DECGL comes in. It provides you a way of managing all these layers to create a WebGL context to reuse that context and to make it really performant. Um, and then LumaGL, we decided to go with this because um, you know, sometimes there are differences around vision and direction uh, for certain like open source frameworks. So for example, some of them want to invest more in VR and AR stuff, which is totally fine and, and fun. 
but then you know things like adding WebGL to support uh, you know, get deprioritized. So we really wanted to have control on that, and so we developed like Web, uh, Luma GL for it. So the cool thing about it, it's a general purpose like with WebGL framework. It is written uh, using ES6 code base, uh, using classes to wrap main WebGL one into entities. So it's actually like, if you want to get familiar with the lower level WebGL stuff, reading the source code of Luma GL is, is, a, good, is a good starting point. Um, and then it's WebGL2 ready, so you can use floating point textures, instancing, transform feedback, um, and so on. All right, so that's, that's the overall architecture. How, how would you use this? What are the, the main use cases? So there are three approaches. I guess they, they get more complex as we go down on that list. But on the right, you get to see some of the core layers. Um, this is an actual like, screenshot of, of the layers. So, uh, you know, we have more than a dozen uh, core layers and, and some of them can be quickly adapted to your needs. Um, so one of those use cases could be using existing layers, which is pretty straightforward. Um, another one which is pretty straightforward as well is creating adapter layers, which we'll visit. And then finally, if you wanted to go more and tweak some shader code, et cetera, um, you could extend these layers uh, to have them customized. So on the first point, using existing layers, if you go to deck.gl, there's a gallery, you'll find a lot of examples. Each one of these examples are standalone examples. Um, you can just clone them, copy them, tweak, tweak them, um, learn from them. Uh, you can view the code for this example. There's a fat arrow there. You click there, it'll take you to the GitHub page. Um, and then as you look at the code, you'll see a bunch of props. You can use the documentation, API docs, all interactive. Um, and, and you could kind of figure out like which one of, of these props, like what, what do they do basically. Um, in this case, we're, we're instancing a new scatterplot layer um, and then that's the code in, inside of the larger piece of code. Uh, we're wrapping that around a, a DECGL overlay which instances DECGL as, as part of its return statement and adds that layer in. And then finally, what we do with that DECGL element is we add that DECGL element inside of the MapGL uh, map. So in this case, we have a map with the layer inside of it. Um, on the extending layers, as we, as I mentioned before, you might want, for example, to write your own um, shaders for a layer. Uh, you might want to add uniforms when drawing a layer, so you want to add extra functionality. In this case, for example, base layer, arc layer, arc brushing layer, you want to add a, you know, a mouse over functionality or filtering or something like that. You can do that with the arc brushing layer. Um, and then finally, you know, if you want to go more like wild and, and have your own custom like picking mechanism or you know, have full flexibility into like what WebGL can do um, without it, you know, this framework bothering you, you can just uh, do that by extending the layers as well. An example of this is, uh, I don't know how useful this example is, but it's a, it's a good, good like, you know, illustrative example. Uh, you have a scatter plot layer. Uh, right, it renders a bunch of circles. Uh, you wanted those to be rounded rect rectangles. Um, so in this case, what we do is we extend the scatter plot layer, um, and then we override the draw function. So what we do in the draw function is we just call the same draw function as before, but we pass in a new uniform. You can think of a uniform as a prop, um, and it's a corner radius, right? Um, and then on the shaders, instead of uh, passing in the same shaders as before, now since we're adding a new functionality to these shaders, uh, we'll pass in our own custom fragment shader. Uh, but we'll reuse the same vertex shader as before. Uh, and then finally we set up like the, uh, the default props for the corner radius there. Um, uh, basically, this is, this is a fragment shader. I'm not gonna go much into detail for that, but in order to create, so imagine it renders like rectangles in order to create a circle, uh, it discards a bunch of pixels that are being rendered on the screen. So you can, you can control that basically from the corner radius uh, prop, uniform. And then finally, uh, composite layers. So as, as I mentioned in the architectural diagram, like you can manage multiple primitives into one layer. GeoJSON is, is a good, clear example of that. Um, I think that the, the cool thing about it is that it breaks down a complex rendering problem into smaller testable classes that you can reuse. Um, but you know, you could also use composite layers to do some data processing or aggregation before you do the rendering. We talked about the uh, uh, hexagonal layer, that video like does some aggregation before the rendering. Um, the uh, Voronoi layer that I just 
exemplify it like, you know, you're passing a bunch of sites, you compute the Voronoi using V3. Once you have those uh, polygons, you can render them with a polygon layer. That's a way of adapting a layer, changing their interface, so it suit, suits better your, uh, your specific like domain and problem. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty, those are pretty much kind of the, uh, the use cases where uh, we see people um, uh, kind of like plugging into the framework. So we, for that, we audited um, a lot of the APIs, made sure that they were like consistent across multiple layers and also like provided good documentation uh, for these specific three use cases. Um, so I, the first year at Uber, I stopped coding. So for a year and a half, I didn't code and I went back to coding for this example um, and I realized why I stopped coding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting use case. It's a way of like, you know, creating uh, custom layers um, to visualize wind. And in this case, the data is for the wind is not correct. Uh, we do some data processing from sparse data uh, coming from different uh, kind of uh, wind stations uh, to have like a more uniform pattern um, so we can render this. Uh, but I wanted to showcase that because I think it's an interesting also way of using WebGL to do just data processing and not the rendering itself. So the story for this example, uh, two years ago, as, as Irene mentioned, like I was here and I showed a wind map as well. And last year, uh, Patricio, uh, who used to work at Maps and then um, took the same data set and also created a visualization of wind using Tangram, which is a, an awesome tool. And, uh, and so I wanted to do a re-remix of this. Um, it, you know, the data's already cleaned up, it's easier. Um, so uh, something that really bothered me though about this data set was the fact that, you know, the data set is like sparse, right? You have all these points, they encode uh, wind velocity, direction, um, temperature and, and, um, and elevation. But, you know, they're discrete points, they're not interpolated. If you pick a random point on a map, you won't get the data for it. So how can we like linearly interpolate all this data in a sense that, you know, no matter where you are in the US, you can get some sort of approximation of what the wind uh, information is. So um, you, you do triangulation. So basically what we do is we can encode wind speed into a color channel. Let's imagine like, you know, red and angle to green and, um, yeah, speed or I don't know what, you know, temperature on, on blue. And so you can, you can render those dots as colors, right, into an image. And every color will encode this uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional uh, data. So what do you do with the intermediate points where, you know, if you have that as a triangle uh, and you render it through, you know, WebGL, like the GPU is really fast at like linearly interpolate all these values in between. So you could, you could use that, um, um, you know, you could take advantage of that to, to do that uh, for all your data sets. So the only thing that we need to do first is the Delaunay triangulation for the, for the stations in the US. And I think this might be the first time I use the Delaunay triangulation for like something that's useful and not only pretty. Um, and so once we render that, uh, these are a bunch of triangles, right? So you will get all that interpolated and it will return an image where you can sample any pixel in that image and you'll get that uh, interpolated wind value. So the step after that was um, getting a vector field to show up. So for that, we created a layer, used the instancing paradigm, right? So we have a bunch of lines. They can clone uh, multiple times. And, and that way, we can uh, basically have an overlay of, of how the wind looks like at every point in the US. And this is the first kind of approximation of it. So we used the Delaunay triangulation also to encode elevation. We use it as a... As a as another, yet another layer. Uh, we have a, a layer for the stations, a layer for the Delaunay triangulation, and a layer for the uh, vector field. Um, so I use that, I added a, a little bit of lighting and stuff like that uh, during the process. And this is the first stage. So on the left you have a, a slider. So these are the last 72 hours of wind. So you can see that vector field kind of interpolate. On the top right, you get to see like the, the, the outlier of wind, like Mount Washington, where uh, wind is like exponentially stronger than, than anywhere else. Uh, so don't go there. And, <laughs> um, and then 
um, and then at the bottom you get to see some of the uh, stations, right? So every yellow dot there is a station, but we don't care about them anymore because we're interpolating all of the data. So the next thing uh, that I decided to use was uh, transform feedback. And this is a, a new technique, that, well, a new feature that WebGL2 has. And I'm not gonna go into detail with, with the rendering pipeline, but um, previously, you know, it starts from the left to the right, right? So you pass in a bunch of points, imagine like, you know, 3D coordinates as an array. Um, it goes through the vertex shader, which is programmable. You can, you know, type in GLSL code and you can perform like affine transformations to those points. So you can translate them, rotate them, scale them, do stuff like that. Um, and then there are multiple other processes, like you know, from the points you create triangles. From the triangles, you know, you, you have a 3D concept, you need to put it on the screen so you rasterize it. And then it goes through the fragment shader, which uh, as, you know, after rasterization, it decides like which color to add to each pixel on the screen. But what we care about though is that vertex shader there. Like that's pretty interesting. You pass in a bunch of points and you can do a lot of like computations in the GPU in parallel and, uh, and, and sometimes you don't really need to render the stuff in the end. Like you could just do random math with it, right? Um, and so WebGL2 enables this thing called transform feedback where we can basically use the output of a vertex shader as a buffer and use that as data. So you could imagine yourself just, you know, uh, defining a sign function in, uh, in the vertex shader and passing in a random array of points and then getting back that sign function back. Um, there is a little bit of overhead of like creating the buffer and sending it in, et cetera, but it's overall super fast and, and made uh, parallel. So this is how it looks like. Uh, there are some vortices uh, in Florida. Uh, so we throw particles about a million like randomly in the US and at every point we sample uh, the place in the texture where those particles are uh, moving around and we kind of update the velocity and the, the position of that particle. Um, and then as you change the time, you'll, you'll just like keep sending over particles. Uh, every particle has a time to leave. So, you know, they'll move around for, I don't know, a few seconds, then I'll take them back, throw them at some other random place. Um, so, of course, what's interesting is, well, you know, there are interesting patterns, like you have finer granularity on top of your data. Um, and, and the way it's being visualized, I think it can be, can be reused in multiple ways. Actually, we'll, we'll add these layers or as core layers at, in, in some like, later version of DECGL. But it also shows you the flexibility of the framework, right? You can just plug in anything, build your own, your own layers, and, and create an app with it. So uh, I'm taking all the credit, but this is, this is a DECGL team. Um, as I mentioned before, we do visualization within you know, business insights, advanced analytics, and a lot of core visualization work more around centered like around computer graphics. So this team has been working thoroughly uh, on that. It started as an internship project uh, by Yang Wang there, and now it's pretty core to like a dozen different internal apps at Uber, so that was pretty powerful. Um, thanks. <laughs>